talking about a purely resistive, a purely capacitive, and a purely inductive circuit. It's like driving a Volkswagen, but we are going to move up to a Ferrari at this point. We're going to put them all three together. We call it an RLC circuit. R for resistance, L for inductance, C for capacitance. Why are we going to do this thing? It's because we need to understand impedance in order to understand body fat scales and many other biomedical applications. When you stand on these body fat scales, there are conducting electrodes on the balls and the heels of your feet and that sends a current up through your body from your right leg down to your left leg and back and forth at a high frequency. So this current is 50 kilohertz, uh, 50,000 cycles per second. This current is passing through your, the lower part of your body. It's not much current. It's not going to hurt you. And, uh, but what it does is it measures the impedance of the lower part of your body. What's impedance? We're going to define it, but I just wanted to tell you why we might be interested in it. Muscle has low impedance at this frequency, but fat has a high impedance, and so your body fat percentage can be measured with one of these devices, um, which measures your bioelectric impedance. All right, let's define impedance. In this concept will define it, and in the next one, we'll actually calculate it. The total, uh, the impedance of a series RLC circuit. Here's my R, here's my L, and here's my C. I think the lab cars it calls it an RCL circuit, sometimes LRC circuit, whatever. You just got to get those three letters together, an R and an L and a C. And they're all in series with each other. So the, the first thing to understand with this circuit is what these symbols mean. What's V naught? Well, V naught is something we've dealt with before. That is the peak voltage of the AC source. Happy day. V sub R is the peak voltage through the resistor. Can you say, well, I think I'm getting the idea here. V sub C should therefore be the peak voltage through the capacitor, and you'd be right. And V sub L is the peak voltage through the inductor. Happy day. So those are all peak, not RMS voltages, but peak voltages. And um, so let's define the impedance of a series RLC circuit. Not notice that these all three are in series. What can I say about element, circuit elements that are in series with each other? What does it mean to be in series? It means that the current through each one is the same. So the currents is the same through all three elements, through the R, the L, and the C. Okay? All right, finally, let's define this impedance. Let's get to it. The total opposition to the flow is called the impedance, and it's denoted by the letter Z and it's measured in ohms. Here's the definition of impedance. The root mean square voltage of the AC source. So VRMS That's what that is. 
RMS. Like we've talked about before, there's nothing new here. IRMS is the root mean square current in the circuit. It's measured in amps. RMS voltage is the source, measured in volts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that current, that RMS current, is the RMS current through the AC source, through the resistor, through the capacitor, through the inductor. It's the same RMS current through all of them. The current doesn't change. It's all, it, that's what it means to be in series. The current has to be the same. All right, Z. Z is what's new. That's the impedance. It's measured in ohms. What other things do we know that are measured in ohms? Resistance, capacitive reactants, inductive reactants, and now one more to the list, impedance. And how do we know it's measured in ohms? It's because it looks just like this V equals IR, and we know that if we got a voltage here and a current here, then whatever's left over has to be measured in ohms. All right, that's the definition of impedance. Now, looking at this, these phasor relationships is going to help us in the next slide, which is where we're going to do a little bit of math. If If this is the current phasor, I0, denoted by the red arrow, then the resistance phasor has to be pointed in the same direction. Why? It's because there's no phase difference between the current and the resistance in a purely resistive circuit. This is the capacitance phasor. It's in this direction because the current must lead it. So you can't see it very well. This is the capacitive uh, phasor, capacitance phasor. This is the current phasor. The current phasor has to lead it around. And this is the inductance phasor. The current has to lag behind the inductance phasor. So here's the inductance phasor. Here's the current which is behind it. Inductance phasor with the current lagging behind it. So that's the way that, that phasor diagram has to work. And what we'll normally do with this diagram is to say, well, this capacitance phasor and the inductance phasor point in opposite directions, both perpendicular to the current phasor. And so what we'll do is we'll subtract the capacitance phasor from the inductance phasor and get a diagram that looks like this. So this is the VL minus VC, so it's kind of a combination inductance capacitance phasor, in this direction. Here's a resistance phasor, and then finally V0 is, uh, is the actual AC phasor. So this is the one that represents how much of the peak voltage through the AC source. This peak voltage right here. So we've got a triangle. And this triangle has a, a phase angle phi that we're going to use in doing this, um, doing this math. All right? Derive the impedance phase and power equations for a series RLC circuit. V naught, what's that? Peak voltage through the AC source, just like we talked about. 
VRMS. What's that? The RMS voltage through the AC source. How are they related by the square root of 2? How do we find um, VRMS from V0? We divide V0 by square root of 2. So alternatively, we can solve for V0 and multiply VRMS by, by square root of 2 in order to get V0. That's just a um, previous relationship between peak and RMS. No big deal. Well, we just wrote down VRMS. We defined the impedance as VRMS equals IRMS times Z. So VRMS, I'm just using the equation that I just sp uh, spoke about. VRMS is IRMS times Z. No big deal. Just combining concepts. VR, what's that? The peak voltage across the resistor. That's related to the RMS voltage across the resistor by the square root of 2. But the RMS voltage across the resistor is I RMS times R. That's from the purely resistive uh, circuit that we talked about a couple of, uh, two, three or four slides ago. VRRMS for the resistor is IRMS times R. We do the same thing for the capacitor and the inductor. VL is the peak voltage across the inductor equals the RMS voltage across the inductor. And that, according to concept, I think it was the second concept that we did, is IRMS times X sub L. What's that called? I heard you. Inductive reactance. So that's the inductive reactance measured in ohms. And then V sub C, same thing here, applying. Now, This vector, this phasor, has length V0. But V0 is proportional to Z, and the, co the coefficient of proportionality is the square root of 2 times I RMS. This um, VR is also proportional to R, and the coefficient of proportionality is square root of 2 times I RMS. Same thing here, VL minus VC is going to be pr proportional to XL minus XC. Let me just write that one down. VL minus VC equals the square root of 2 I RMS times XL minus XC. I've just combined these two equations together. I've subtracted VL minus VC, and then we have these two things that are common. I've factored them out, and then the result is XL minus XC. So the important thing to note here <laughs> is that I can replace these peak voltages by re uh, resistances and reactances. So instead of VR, I'm going to replace that by R. Instead of V0, I'm going to replace it by Z. It's proportional to Z. And instead of VL minus VC, I'm going to replace it by XL minus XC. It's just the concept of similar triangles. You've got a triangle of V0, uh, VR, and VL minus VC. Um, and that's a certain size of a triangle. But if you scale all the lengths of each leg of the triangle, you get a similar triangle. And the similar triangle has lengths um, R along this axis, XL minus XC along this axis, and then Z along the hypotenuse. So the two legs of the triangle are R and XL minus XC. And then the hypotenuse is Z, the impedance. And that is exactly what we're trying to find. 
we're trying to derive the impedance, the phase, and the power equations for a ser series RLC circuit. And we get it from this diagram. How can we find z? We just appeal to our old friend Pythagoras. The hypotenuse squared is the sum of the squares of the two sides. Here's the hypotenuse squared. Here's the side 1 squared, and here's side 2 squared. That's z squared. You can take the square root of that to find the actual z. So z squared equals r squared plus the quantity xl minus xz squared. We could do a little bit more geometry. The tangent of this, this is called the phase angle, phi. The tangent of that angle, and again looking at the same triangle with the same sides, is the side opposite, which is xl minus xc, divided by the side adjacent, which is r. So here's the opposite side, xl minus xc, divided by r. There's another relationship that's often used, the cosine of the angle phi. That's r, that's a side adjacent over the hypotenuse, r over z. So those are the impedance phase relationships, and now we're interested in the power relationship for this case. This one is pretty cool. And the reason is, we know how much power the capacitor and the inductor use up on average. And the answer is a big fat goose egg. Zero. Nada. And so to get the power, the only circuit element we have to worry about is the resistor. IRMS times VRMS. And this is what we actually wrote down for the purely resistive circuit. I've just got slightly uh, different notation. I've got an R here reminding me that this is the voltage, the RMS voltage across the resistor. Well, V across the resistor is IRMS times R. We already did that. And R, you can solve this equation for R. Let's do it. R equals Z cosine phi. That's going to go in here. And so there's my Z cosine phi. And now I want to combine these two guys. I RMS times Z. You say I'm really tired, <laughs> but have no fear. V, this is just V RMS. V RMS is I RMS times Z. What's that? You say well, that's just the definition of impedance. That's how we defined it. It's the overall resistance to uh, the circuit. And this is the average power equation for the RLC circuit. It looks very similar to what we had for a resistor, but it's not identical. For, for a resistor, we just had IRMS times VRMS, but now we've got this phase relationship here that matters. All right, a resistor, an inductor, and a capacitor are connected in series with a voltage source. So that voltage source is always going to look like that. Which one of the following statements concerning this circuit is false? Well, let's look at them one by one. The current through each of the circuit elements must be the same. True or false? That's true. because they're all in series. The sum of the potential differences at any time t across each of the elements must be equal Well, this is really stated a bit poorly. The sum of the potential differences at any time t 
across all of the elements must be equal to V. That's true because uh, using the loop rule, Kirchhoff's rule, if we talk about the potential difference across this battery, then that's going to have to add up to the potential difference across the resistor plus the potential difference across the capacitor plus the potential difference across the inductor. So that has to be true. Okay. The impedance of the circuit is equal to the square root of XL squared minus XC squared. Is that true? Well, here's the impedance. The squared impedance is that guy here. So the impedance squared is equal to R squared plus XL minus XC quantity squared. So this, is, uh, this isn't true. The impedance is going to be the square root of Z squared. That's the impedance, not this. Uh, unless the, um, and this isn't even correct f for this. The XL, you can't just bring that square into here. You have to foil it out. XL squared minus 2XL XC plus 2XC squared. You can't just do it like that. So that one's wrong. Uh, the voltage of one of the elements has a different phase than that of the other two elements. That's true. The resistor, the capacitor, and the inductor all have different phase relationship, uh, are at different phases with respect to each other. So limiting behavior of capacitors and inductors. This is a really cool exercise. The RMS voltage resistances and capacitances and inductance are the same in A, this circuit here, and in B. And the frequency is very near zero. In which circuit does the generator produce more RMS current? So here's the trick. This looks like a terrible circuit, and, and it, it is not a series RLC circuit. But we're going to be able to use our knowledge of the behavior of capacitors and inductors at low and high frequencies in order to analyze this circuit. And I'll give you a couple of problems to, to work on to practice. So at low frequencies, XC is high. Why is that true? X sub C is 1 over what? 2 pi f c. So x sub c, if you plot it as a function of frequency, remember at high frequencies, x sub c becomes low. And at low frequencies, x sub c becomes high. So now we're talking about low frequencies, x sub c is high. So that's the justification here. Low frequencies means we're, we're looking down in this region, x sub c is big. And capacitors can be replaced by gaps in the circuit. So we're th if you think about this capacitor at low frequency as being like a huge resistance, it's measured in ohms, you could just think of it as a huge resistor, there's not going to be much current that passes through it. And that's exactly the right way to think about it. At low frequencies, these capacitors can be replaced by gaps in the circuit. So in the low frequency limit, this capacitor can be replaced by a gap. So there's no, no current, uh, significant amount, no significant amount of current that can pass through this circuit. Same with this capacitor here, replaced by a gap.
All right. Um, and so in the, then this circuit becomes quite simple in the low frequency limit because as effectively we just have uh, the current passing through this resistor and then this resistor and then back to here. We can analyze that without any trouble at all. Uh, those are two resistors in series with each other. They have the same current. So the currents come through here, through this one. The, the current can't get through here, so we still have the same current here as we did here. Current comes down through here, through this resistor. Both of them are have the same current, and we can just work out what the, what the current in the circuit is. So effectively, how we have a resistance of 2R in this low frequency limit. Also, L XL is low, and inductors can be replaced by wires of zero resistance. So let's look at this circuit. Oh, I'm sorry. XL is low. How do we know that in the low frequency limit? Well, let's remind ourselves of what XL is. 2 pi F times L itself. And let's remind us ourselves what XL looks like as a function of frequency. Well, if the frequency is low, then XL just goes to zero. So for low frequencies, this region down here, XL is small. So XL is low, and inductors can be replaced by wires of zero resistance. So um, what we've actually done, I already did it. I didn't really say what I was doing. Here's an inductor right here. At the very low frequency limit, that inductor does nothing. It's effectively not even there. It, well, it's effectively replaced by just a wire because it doesn't have any resistance to the, to the flow. So we replace this inductor just by a straight piece of wire. That's all there is to it. And um, so, so this particular, this is another example of a circuit the, um, that we can analyze in the limit of, of low frequencies. We're going to replace this inductor just by a straight through wire. We're going to replace this capacitor with a gap in the circuit. This inductor by a straight through wire. And you say, what about the resistors? And I say, remember the resistors don't depend on frequency. The, the amount, uh, what they do doesn't depend on frequency. The resistance is independent of the frequency. So we just get um, uh, a circuit that looks like this with the capacitance having a gap here. This gives us two resistors in parallel now. So if we have current coming through this uh, from this AC source, it has to split into two different paths to go through these two different resistors. And the effective resistance is um, R over 2. 1 over the R uh, in, C in parallel equals 1 over the one of the r's plus 1 over the other r, that's 2 over r, and then invert that, and you get that the effective circuit is r over 2 for this circuit from our, our discussion about, about resistors in series and in parallel. So ultimately, wh in which circuit does the generator produce more RMS current in this uh, the low frequency limit. Well, this one has an effective, let me just draw this, this, this circuit again. Here's the AC source. Here's the effective circuit. 
that this one turned into. And this one turned into this circuit with an effective resistance of R over 2. Well, which one generates more current? That has a higher resistance, so it's going to have a lower current. So this one will generate the higher, higher current. Now, at high frequencies, and we'll have some problems to deal with this too, the roles of inductors and capacitors is reversed. So I'll give you some chances to, um, to actually practice on, on looking at the, the high frequency limit as well. So at high frequencies, this inductor has a high uh, inductive reactance. And that means it's going to be replaced by gaps in the circuit. Whereas the capacitive reactance at high frequencies, high frequencies down here, the capacitive reactance is small. And so uh, it can be replaced by um, wires of zero resistance. A uh, circuit contains an inductor, a capacitor, and a light bulb connected to Sean. And which frequency limit is the light bulb the brightest? Let's look at the low frequency limit first. Low frequency limit, okay? And, and the easiest way for me to do with these problems is to think about those two curves. The capacitive reactance as a function of frequency, which looks like this, and the inductive reactance as a function of frequency, which looks like this. All right. In the low frequency limit, that's down here, the capacitive reactance is high. It looks like a huge resistor, and you can replace it with a gap in the low frequency limit. The inductor in the low frequency limit here, the, the inductive reactance is very small. And so it can be replaced by a straight through wire. Well, what does that give us? It gives us a circuit that looks like there's a gap here. So you're not going to get any current through this gap. Uh, and, and therefore, there won't be any current through this bulb because this is a branch of the circuit and the current through any branch of the circuit is the same anywhere in that branch in the circuit. And in this branch of the circuit, there's no current. So it's going to be dim. The light bulb is going to be dim here. What about on the high frequency limit? So now we're looking up here in the high frequency limit. In this case, the capacitive reactance, X sub C, is small. So that capacitor can be replaced by a straight through wire. And then the inductive reactance is high, so it acts like a huge resistor, and it's not going to want to pass any current. And so in this particular case, we get a circuit that looks like, well, that's a light bulb straight through the capacitor, and then we got a gap. Can't get any current through that gap, so we're going to get um, the light bulb being bright. See how powerful this is? You can just let the math teach you what you need to know.